This is the strategy inside everything. I'm Adam Pierno. All right, welcome back to the strategy inside everything. We are back after a bit of a layoff and coming to you from New York, Charlie. Is that where you are today? Yes, yes. Uh, Gowanus, Brooklyn, in fact. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I have the chief strategy officer and managing partner at Mother, Charlie McKittrick. Charlie, thank you so much for joining me via the interwebs. I really appreciate you making time for me. Oh, it's super good to be here. It's good to see you and meet you. Yeah, yeah. We've already been uh, getting up to speed and getting to know each other. And I think we're going to have a really great conversation. For my own context, I've obviously stalked you on LinkedIn before we got going here. But um, I think for the listeners... Sorry to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> I think for the listeners, would you give them a sense of how you got to the, the role that you're currently in at Mother? Yes, yes. Uh, with two caveats. A, um, it's a terribly unstrategic process, so there's very little to be learned from it. Um, and two, I hate talking about myself. And so um, even though I spend my entire career sitting in rooms introducing myself to very senior clients and large groups of people, every time it gets to me, I choke. It makes um, me sweaty to, to tell people my career path. I, I feel I know, it's, exactly. It's terrible, but I guess it's therapeutic. Um, I mean, I did. And, and it's also sort of a, 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 I, I took the occasion of talking to you to sort of reflect back on it, too, because there's whatever there's been a number of changes. And I do. I'm, my sister's a therapist also in Arizona, and she always talks to me about how people get stuck in their narrative. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, well, why don't I just rethink what the narrative is? Anyway, not that I know. it. Basically, I think there's basic there's sort of three parts. There's kind of uh, the early L.A. years. Uh, there's sort of Ogilvy and Mather to mother years. And then there's recently, which is sort of mother, but on a on a bigger picture uh, sort of basis that I think we'll go talk about, which is our, our new building in Gowanus and a lot of the new um, companies we've started and why we've done that and how that all comes together. Definitely. Um, you know, that that it's I basically I was a I was a. a not a failed, but a, a philosophy major uh, who went a, a, astray. I was sort of seeking responsibility and application. And I'd had a professor who'd done a lot of uh, documentaries popularizing philosophical topics. And I thought, oh, well, that would be cool. And so I went to LA to sort of become a filmmaker and I fell in love with cinematography. And I thought that was going to be my thing. And I met up with this sort of great Romanian auteur, a guy named Adrian Velicescu. And we sort of, um, fell in together and did a couple of projects and including a, a, a feature film in Sundance um, uh, and a number of things, but also including sort of starting a business um, at that point too, to sort of fund the filmmaking. Uh, but it was probably an early digital business. It was sort of, we had all this equipment that we'd created, <laughs> we'd, we'd bought and put together in order to have more control over our filmmaking. And then it turns out you could use that to do a lot of things for clients. Um, and so we developed that into a business uh, and then that was super interesting. Um, but is, I think it, that is interesting. I, I, normally, I, I don't interrupt during the uh, the career context <laughs> portion, but it, I find it very interesting that you started with the idea of documenting, telling sto telling real stories. That was your primary interest was was figuring out how to bring those cultural stories to life. Yeah, actually, yes, but I think it was also. I, I mean, I think one of the things I thought in reflecting just in talking to it's also for me it was about sense making yeah. which is a lot and I know that sounds like a crazy word and I apologize for using it on a, po a podcast about strategy <laughs> um, but it's like that's what philosophy is right philosophy is sort of like how does the world work how do we make sense of it and I think that's what I liked about the idea of making films about philosophy was um, helping people understand the world because philosophy usually just tends to stay among philosophers but there's a lot of things that can help us, you know, as we battle ethical issues and scientific issues and all sorts of issues to bring it out. Um, but I also think it, it bridges to a little bit, even just then starting a company in order to fund, support the films. I was also like, really interested, how does this company work? Like, how do you build a company? And I, I think I got really interested too in our clients. And I was like, I don't understand why our clients are buying what they're buying. And I don't understand how it's helping them in their businesses. Um, and so I think a little bit, that's what then led me to then sort of bridge to the next phase, which was I went and got my uh, MBA because um, I sort of thought, well, if, you know, if, if capitalism is the lifeblood of a you know, modern uh, you know, uh, economy, I better understand how that works. You went right to the source. 
yeah so i went right to the source um and so so that so then i followed that and then i i got i got an internship right the, the fight for internships in business schools um as i don't know I'm, maybe some of your host guests have talked about it's 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 a mercenary um but i wasn't very mercenary and i literally i took an internship off of somebody who just had an extra one basically <laughs> he was like oh i developed this internship at old and mather but i've decided to go to europe and like help start an electrical company um would you like it and i, I was like it. yeah i'll take it <laughs> i love it it's like there's an empty seat i'm hopping in Oh my God, a shame. I mean, it's literally, it's probably like one of the biggest like bifurcating branches in my career. And it was literally just because some dude was like, hey, I got this internship. Do you want it? And I was like, yeah, I haven't developed one for myself yet. I love it. Um, but it turned out it was, I mean, uh, uh, great luck because Ogilvy was, was sort of a perfect place to bring together sort of a former, you know, creative, both filmmaking and design background, but then my sort of newly learned like business, you know, sort of like theory and application and skills um, and sort of put those together, um, you know, and it's a great place. It's a great training ground. Uh, there's pockets of great work in, in, in Ogilvy, especially in those days. Um, and so I, I spent a couple of years there. And I think what, what was great too is strategically, there was such variation it was so large that we had brand strategy and we had communication strategy and were we had you commercial doing planning strategy or were you on the account side or what what role did you take i was i was in this sort of weird group called strategy i think we called it marketing strategy mm -hmm. and it was a little bit of uh brand planning it was a little bit of commercial planning and it was a little bit of um media you know meeting connections planning and it's sort of in that era sort of the big it's it's funny it's a pendulum swing the the big five consulting had started to eat the big agencies brand lunch and the big agencies yeah. were trying to protect against that so they were sort of trying to up their the sophistication of their strategic skills and their business acumen um which is why they they liked they liked me um, but I think, you know, so it was, it was great. And it was exposure to all these different disciplines. And I just sort of like mopped up as much as I could about every other job yeah. other than the ones that I was doing. Um, and I eventually built a sort of a great department in there, which was a sort of a, a, a marvelous hybrid of all of the things, but that was the core tension. Like it, I was an integrator. I felt, oh, we've got to bring all these things together. And then that's how you solve really big and interesting problems. Um, and that's what clients want. Clients don't want 32 people all thinking about a micro segment of their problem totally. in they a large room. They want the assembly line. They want the philosophy of how it's going to get fixed all yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. But that was sort of a countervailing tension to Ogilvy. Ogilvy is a, Ogilvy is a, a like a disaggregator. They just want like the best specialists in every unit. And so we eventually just like had competing tensions because I, I thought you could find enough sort of brilliant, funky few people to do all of the things really well. Um, and that's where mother sort of came knocking. Um, and again, the energy of mother felt a lot like the energy of LA, you know, a decade before where we were just like, you know, sitting in a warehouse downtown, <laughs> like doing really interesting things. And it was sort of confusing. Um, but mother had just moved from Bond Street, where they'd started in America, and they'd sort of kind of crossed this line. They bought this or got this big three story building up on 11th Avenue. Um, and they sort of it was they, they were like they went from like 30, like highly irresponsible, um, highly creative people. to all of a sudden they were like 60 and climbing. And they were I think a little bit they were like. Hey Charlie, can you help us be a little bit more disciplined yeah. and do rigorous? Think, do you think sixty is the number? Is I've always I have a lot of uh, conversations about you know where's the number where it goes from free form collective of creative thinkers to we have to get serious and get our act together. Let's hire an MBA to lead us. You know, is is it about sixty or have you seen it? I've seen it go higher, but I've also seen it at twelve where somebody said we need to we need some someone to help frame this up for us or with us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a little bit earlier than 60, though, I think, de <laughs> depending, you know, depending on what your tolerance for pain is, you can, you know, get to 60. But it was it was I don't think you could go much farther than 60 at all. I think also just the the, the complexity of the kinds of clients you need to have in order to feed that many mouths. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden just demands a level of sophistication. And you've had a great run at Mother. I mean, you've been there a decade, so you've seen the further growth that that place has obviously turned into a um, continuing the legacy of the original 
uh, office and just always yeah. plugged into to great work. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, again, I feel, I feel grateful. <laughs> I feel grateful that I ran across Mark Robinson who had a free internship for me. And I felt grateful that like I ran across mother who's um, also independent, financially independent and privately held, which I do think is one of the secrets to the business and creative universe. But it's, I think because of that, it has this combination of uh, a quest for audacity, right? The level of creativity that we want from ourselves is incredibly high. Um, and there's just this common spirit of like, oh, if that's, if that's an answer that somebody else would have come up with, like, is that really the answer we want? Like, let them go to that other agency to get that same answer. Like, let's give them the one that we want to give them. How um, much How much of that? Because I know, you know, a lot of the debate you'll have in an agency, a lot of the debate we have is, hey, is this is this work the right answer for our brand? But do you have an internal debate that is, is this, does this feel like something that only could come from mother on top of that filter of, is it right for the brand? Is no, that something that's actually absolutely not. Okay. No, if anything, we, I think one of the, one of the other characteristics of mother is a creative promiscuity, mm. both in form, meaning experiential, digital, big advertising, you know, big, big Super Bowl spots, whatever, starting companies, building companies, investing in companies, uh, like that kind of promiscuity, um, as, as well as just tonal promiscuity. I think yeah. we, we, there, there shouldn't really be a, a tone to mother other than unbelievably ambitious, audacious answers to clients that work. Um, and there's a little, there's probably a little bit of a rebelliousness to it, um, which isn't, you know, which again, I don't even think shows up tonally in the work, but it just should show up in the, like, when you see the work, you're, you should feel like, God, I can't believe that they had the chutzpah to fucking put that in front of a client and get them to do it. But always because it works, like it's never, yes. it's never to trick a client. It's never, it's always because we legitimately understand what that client's business is. And we legitimately believe that that's really the best way to answer it. Yeah. yeah. And how do you because I know you have a background in philosophy and you have an MBA and you've obviously been <laughs> doing this at a high level at O&M. And um, I don't think we call it that anymore at, at Ogilvy um, <laughs> and at uh, mother for a long time. How do you balance the philosophy side, the business side, and then prove out, you know, because creativity is, as we know, is, there's a lot of subjectivity. How do you make that case in, in, when there is something on the table that you say we really feel strongly, is it through data? Is it through gut? Is it just through, you know, conversations and in hearing concerns and trying to figure out how to address or knock them down? I mean, I, I'm going to give you a terrible answer, which is it's literally every single thing you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'll give you uh, one observation and then one a set of facts. <laughs> one observation is I feel like advertising, I think there was an incredible hustle to advertising in the early days. And the people who started those agencies were entrepreneurs. Um, they were incredibly, and entrepreneurialism is creative. Um, yes. And so, but they were simultaneously um, dogged business people who created an industry that didn't exist, like structured organizations in a way that no other organizations had been structured, you know, like they were, but also incredibly audacious and creative. And then I think there was an era where they got bought up by the holding companies and then they became sort of cash flow generators for um, basically a portfolio holding company that's just mopping up cash flows because the margins are so good. And I think that's when advertising lost its business edge a little bit and when it got defensive, right? All of a sudden, I think that's when creativity and business got disaggregated and it was something you had to hide from a client or justify or trick a client into. And I think the nice thing about Mother and I think Robert Saville, who started the business in London and Paul and even Peter Revai, who's our CEO now, um, is that it's like, it's always been the same thing for us. And I think because we're independent, we have that early, it feels to me like that early entrepreneurialism in advertising where it's like, it's all we want are really, really big problems to solve. And all we want is to solve them in really, really interesting ways. And we don't think that business is this other thing. I think that's the mistake a lot of advertising made a decade ago was they're like, business is a different conversation. It's a different skill set. It's scary. We need to hire different kinds of people to have different kinds of conversation that we have. And I think the answer is like, 
That's not actually really true. It's exactly the same. You need to understand the logic. You need to understand the difference between, you know, gross margin and operating margin. You have to understand just like whatever, when you start talking about distribution, that you're going to start to lose margin and have capital costs. But it's not, you know what I mean? Like you don't have to hire different people to do it. You can have one simultaneous um, answer. So that's part one of mine. Can I do part two? Absolutely. (laughs) Um, So that's part one, which is just my observation, which is like, Business doesn't need to feel different than creativity. We can do them together. Yep. Um, but I think then to your to the, the your sort of like palette of options is I do think you need a lot of things. And I think a little bit that's why we've just sort of kicked off um, this new office in Gowanus in Brooklyn. It's a 60,000 foot creative playground for people. Um, but it's it's because we have all we I I feel like we need all of these new things. Like we started a media company um, over the pandemic. We started a production company over the pandemic. We've got Mother Design for years, and it's one of like right. the greatest design shops in the country that I think still um, can do like incredible things. Um, we've got this thing called Mother Goods that does sort of products for like no good reason other than we think they're amazing and they make us laugh. Uh, and then we've got a series of like venture investments that. Um, we think bring creative energy and experience back to us. But I think that's to your to the way you even outline those those options. Like we see that as like there's this big table and we're all sitting around the table. Um, and it's how Robert started mother 20 plus years ago was at his kitchen table. So we need all of those people. Um, and then depending on the right answer, it's not everybody has to be at the table all the time, but right. depending on what the problem is and what the answer is, maybe you do need some really rigorous, um, you know, uh, media data in order to show that there's a brilliant system that can bring this to life. Maybe you do need a really interesting, um, you know, production system that's actually using creators on the ground and like harnessing the energy of like people actually doing things to bring that forward. Um, you know what I mean? Maybe you know, whatever, but I think those are all the conversations we like to have with our clients. But because we have all of that stuff working together when we need it to, um, we can have a simultaneous sort of creative and a creative conversation that a client believes like these guys want the best for me. They understand how my business works and they've been able to tell me a story that's both persuasive, analytic, poetic, intuitive, (laughs) and quantified, um, you know, so that I believe them and we go on this journey together. Yeah. So it's funny because when you described your, your first role at Ogilvy, you mentioned that, that, assembly line model that that we've seen that's what the holding companies essentially created and that's what um the push into digital sort of forced was okay we're going to have this person who's going to hand off to this person we're going to streamline we're going to maximize revenue that way we maximize profit that way um which is pretty antithetical to the way creative really works and then what you just described at mother everybody's sitting around the table is almost the the antidote where do you think you would embrace it if you hadn't lived the opposite or observed the results of the opposite or were you always geared this way? Oh, that's a really good question. And I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, I think having seen the opposite has helped me have more confidence in the position we have now. Um, and to, um, I think it's helped me and us all design the system we do have. Because I do, you said the operative word, which is um, other places where I've worked have had uh, media agencies and analytic businesses and experiential companies, right? They've done that. But the thing that holds all those together is a pursuit of scope. And it's a pursuit of money. Um, Literally, like, you know, probably priority one and two. And, um, and, Charlie, and sure. those when when those holding company agencies bring in their partner from the experiential or the media team, then it becomes the knife fight over. Well, I'm going to take this extra ten percent, and it's it's not partnership; it's kind of this shared battle royal that we have to hide from the client, but we're all fighting over the extra ten hours, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean that's one hundo, and I think it's the worst. For for us, this this is what this is what I like about us, and it's it's something I've 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 learned from Mother, and maybe even from Robert Savile. But it's one of the best ways to make money is to not try to make money, um, <laughs> and I think that that's that's what holds all of 
those people together in, in our system, in the mother system, is that we don't work together because we want the money. And we don't work together because we're getting a greater share of scope. Uh, and we're not working together because we think some, it's the advertising of the future is more quantity. You know what I mean? Like it's not some idea of some trend. We want to work together because we want to do the most bonkers. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. The most bonkers fuck you work that we can that answers the problem in the best way. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's then when everybody's different, right? Because media people are a little bit different than advertising people and they're different than design people and they're different than, everybody's different and that's okay. It's good. But what connects us is because we know each other, we like each other personally, we hang out, there's an informality and a, an unprofessionalism to this place that sort of gets everybody to just meet everybody on their own terms, be their true selves. And then we're inspired by everybody's excellence. Then you sort of see like when experience first got here, A, they hung out for a while, and everybody was like, yeah, they're cool. And they're a little bit, ah, they're different. They feel different. They sort of feel like they come from more of like a promotional background, but whatever, we get it. And then they did the standard spectacular, which is when we, uh, they emptied out the entire Southern face of the standard hotel in Manhattan. It's like 250 rooms, put a dancer in a light kit and a backdrop in every single room, gathered a million people on the West side highway, looking up at the Southern face of the standard hotel and did this like massive light show dance thing. Um, I recommend anybody like go Google it, like well, target standard spectacular we'll mother. Put a link in the, in the show but, notes for sure. But it made then the agency, everybody in the agency then and looked at that and was like, holy moly, that is amazing. And then everybody wanted to do it. So anyway, long way of continuing to answer this, your question the same way is I do think hopefully that's why we can combine those elements in a way that other people can't. It's because what holds us together, what gets us to work together is not a fight over scope or PL. It's a sort of a common desire to do really amazing fuck you work that really solves really big questions too. I mean, I think that's part of Part of my observation about modern creativity is I think the good news is, is it's everywhere and there's more of it and yeah. businesses are embracing it more. I think the bad news is um, we have to fight to keep it big. Um, you know what I mean? I think we have to fight to like answer really big, important questions. And I think that's, that's what drives us is hopefully that sort of personal connection and that shared inspiration and that acceptance of differences in desire of doing really amazing work to really big questions um, is going to allow us to combine those people in a way where it doesn't become like a scope fight or even like a cultural territory war. Yeah, you know, you're giving me so many things. I've just took a bunch of notes. I don't know if we'll get to all of them. But one <laughs> one thing I want to talk about the new space in Gowanus because you built it at this crazy time. You have a pretty ambitious plan. It sounds like you've added a lot of units during COVID and during everything that's going on. What kind of how did you plan for building that, what I'm going to reword, I think, as informal culture and <laughs> kind of the trust factor into the space so that people would go there and feel safe to create and comfortable and in, in the mind space that they need to get to the kind of big audacious solutions that you're chasing or you're trying to encourage or that clients call mother for? Yeah, I mean, I mean, what a scary time to open an office. So just the audacity of ugh. having to deal with that as a brief on its in this current time, that must have been daunting in itself. I mean, that's yeah. And I and I don't know how we did it. We 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 started looking for space even before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic came, you know, for a moment we like our stomachs dropped and we were like, holy oh, shit. Um, but then I think we were like, oh, well, let's take this as an opportunity to then negotiate the best deal that we can. And I think a little bit with Peter, Peter, who's the CEO and my partner and Paul, who's the creative founder, uh, Paul Malmstrom, I, there's a little bit of just a little bit of, again, it's rebellious, um, entrepreneurialism where I think we just all had that instinct, which was like in that those dark days of the pandemic, which is like, we either move forward, we either like get really aggressive, or we slip back, there's no holding holding par here. And we didn't lay anybody off, we didn't fire anybody, we didn't trim anybody's salaries. Uh, that was the nice thing about being a privately owned company, we sort of we just like we took care of everybody, and we got aggressive. Um, and I think it was this fundamental belief that 
proximity is important and proximity is important in creativity and that that all of those different pieces need to inspire each other and they've always inspired each other by being next to each other mm -hmm. like we've always had the our work on the walls because we want I want the target team to see what the Dave and Buster's team is working on yes. um, and partially just to be inspired by it. And even if a designer is sitting there and doing a requirements document, that's you know, 400 pages long, um, they've got this like, you know, board of all their inspiration pinned up and you're like, whoa, what is that minor threat poster from 1982? You've got that's fucking incredible. <laughs> and then they're listening to some crazy music and you're like, what is that? Where did you find that? And then all of a sudden you take that back to your project and I don't know, maybe it helps you. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you just are a little bit more excited than when you have to go and tackle your problem. And so I think it was like deep down in the heart of the pandemic. We just, we knew that we had to get that. We knew that that was not going to go away. Um, and that creativity comes from different people inspiring each other and making connections that you hadn't thought were connected and that that happens in a physical space. Um, and I think that the thing, you know, this is, you know, Paul's Point, and to your question about um, safety and security, like we don't know, you know, like I know we can't make anybody go back to work anymore. <laughs> and I know quite honestly, like the way I'm saying it too, is it's, it's the future of not working. I actually don't need anybody. If you think of, I think when people think of work, they're like, that's when I sit in my cubicle and I have my laptop open <laughs> and my headphones on and I do my work. Like that part of all of our jobs, like we, I never care. I don't care where you fucking do that. Like if that's better to do it at home with your Peloton and your organic lunch, more power to you. But there's advertising is just a series of convenings um, and people coming together and meeting and inspiring yes. each other and stimulating each other. And, um, and that's the part where we want people to come in. And, but again, I think to Paul's point, like he was like, we just have to make a place that people want to come to. Um, he was like, we can't make anybody do it. And so um and so partially, I mean, we're building it out, but I think there's a couple of things. A, he's like, let's create a space where, and this is mother spaces have always been this way, but where people can put their own print on it, yeah. where it's not some designer's vision, you know what I mean? That belongs to Paul Malstrom and somebody else, but it's actually like a place where two years from now, we'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe that the people did that. It's a, it's a vessel that allows them to come in and add, build on it. And yeah, yeah it's kind of the improv yes and model. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other thing too, is he, he sort of, he half made up and, you know, half is, you know, perfectly authentic, this idea of the seven energies um, and whatever it's, by the way, there's not really even seven, there's only six of them, uh, but we keep on talking about the seven energies, but it was Sounds sort of, it was, it was, it's this idea that I've, I've been reading a lot of the architectural, the articles about the future of work and the future of the workplace and all of that stuff. And it's like, I wrote like I keep a list task based pods typologies activity based work areas team rooms collaboration rooms complete hybrid work ecosystems and and I'm like collaboration like I can make a room and call it the collaboration room um, and I can put beanbag chairs and like a swinging chair and some like you know post-it notes colored post-it notes in the middle but that still doesn't make people who think different ways collaborate together like collaboration isn't like sticking your slides in different sections in a document to me collaboration is like calling up somebody and having like it's like lots of little tiny intimate moments where you're like what do you think about this how are you doing that and you listen to what they say and you don't believe five of the pieces but three of the pieces you're like oh that's super cool yeah and then somebody else calls you who's working on the project and is like well, what do you think about this and you're like well I'm thinking about that. you know what I mean it's like all of these little motions and so to me it's like collaboration and connection is about the feeling and the emotion of the space. It's not about the, you know, archetype work process zones. And so a little bit, that's why, you know, Paul designed, he did, he designed the building to these six energies and the six energies are sort of the different, just the different emotional places that anybody wants to be at during the course of the day. And you don't have to go through all six. Maybe you never go through any of them. Maybe you do one in a day, but it's like, sometimes you need really quiet time, um, you know, where nobody disturbs you and you right. just feel Zen. Sometimes you need, you know, a performance time where you stand up in front of a bunch of people and have to sell the shit out of an idea. Sometimes you need like, moderate interaction time with other people where you're not sitting back on the couch, but you're not leaning all forward, but you're just sort of at like a cafe setting. Yep. Sometimes you just want to like hang out with your buddies and you just got like a couple couches and a coffee table and your feet up on the thing. So anyway, so that's, this is a long rambling answer to your, to your question, but which is partially, we just tried to design for the 
the emotional elements that made the place feel good, that makes that ha- makes the place help people feel connected to each other so that then we can collaborate. And then hopefully that inspiration is then what's going to like keep people coming back um, for those parts of working that are important and for the parts that they don't have to, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, how, do, how, especially right now, I mean, the business even before the pandemic was um, more business, more tense, more, you know, squeezing out pennies out of out of each part of the the assembly line for the holding company type agencies how are you balancing how have you been balancing the the fun part of creativity or the adventurous part of creativity with that business solution even you know leading up to the new space oh i mean <clears throat> i mean that's the trillion dollar question um that's why i'm taking notes because that's we we literally have something called the holy trinity that we try to do everything by and it's um great work have fun make a living um and that have fun isn't like you know playing volleyball and foosball that have fun is what you're talking about it's the it's the enjoyable part of doing a really hard job yes um and i so i think we we try to keep that there all the time it's part of my answer adam is like that's a requirement for us. It's not a nice to have. Like if, if, if it's the, it's the job is too hard. Like if it's not actually enjoyable, if you're not enjoying the people you're with and the arguments you're having and the stress that you're going through, then it's not worth doing, but you're right. It's, it, it was, it was really hard. We did, we did this thing called um, mother in the middle. So we, we've studied it a little bit and we, we did sort of an idea EO exercise. We, we, we polled everybody and had lots of of both focus groups and interviews and just quant studies. Um, And we basically came up with a bunch of recommendations. And one of them was we actually did create a, I rented a restaurant. We rented a restaurant in uh, Bushwick uh, for most of the pandemic where people could just go and hang out at distance um, you know, masked, but you could still get together with your team if you wanted to, and you could still get photocopies and you could still go get a free lunch and you could still do that. Nice. We also did this thing, and this is one of my favorite things that we did, but we, we figured out. So one of the, my metaphor was everybody knows how to play soccer. Um, you know what cleats to use, you know, where everybody sits, you know, where the lines are, you know what I mean? Like, you know how the ball flies. And then all of a sudden over the pandemic, like we started playing soccer in space, like the field was bent, there was no gravity, you know what I mean? And yet we were still playing by the same rules. We were conducting meetings in the same way. Uh, we were using the same technologies. Um, and, and so a little bit, the brief was like, what, how can we help establish a new set of rules so that we play soccer in space in the right way? So yeah, yeah, yeah. take advantage so we, of some of the new changes that were, that were all, yeah. now we have these, maybe they're opportunities. 100. Um, and so we did these, we did these things called, they were these little Curtis proper videos. Um, and I'll, I'll send you some if you want to look at them. They're, yeah, just, they're, they're, they're mother mental, but they're really good. And they're just really snackable, um, snackable moments where we try to adjust that sort of the soft part of working together, i.e. being really clear what a meeting is about um, and not necessarily scheduling an hour long meeting for everything, um, i.e. Um, being really clear what format a meeting needs to take. And if it doesn't have to be a Zoom and it can be a phone call, do that. If it can be people meeting in somebody's backyard, do that. If you can just have the meeting versus teletype, do that. Um, uh, for example, all the other things too about we gave everybody lunch off, like no meetings during lunch, but making sure we reinforce that little things about people. Because ident- again, everybody's in different time zones. So yeah. establishing new rules for project teams that were starting where they actually took a moment at the beginning of the project to say, I'm in Sweden, I'm in Denver, I'm in Los Angeles, I've got a kid and I've got to do this. I don't have a kid, but I, you know, and establish a common set of rules that was specific to that team and specific to that project so that, you know, we weren't sort of trying to cram um, you know, this old, this old fashioned set of cleats on yeah. this new turf that worked. Yeah. But it sounds like on a project basis or a team basis, you're giving them freedom to, to make it work for themselves. And so the rules don't have to be rigid for a, you know, the, the corporate rules, who cares? Yeah. I'm yeah. trusting you guys to get the work done. Let's make it work. If yeah. you have kids or if you don't have kids, but you're in a softball league and you want to get out at seven o'clock and make sure you hit your game, like we should make sure that we can do that. No reason you can't. <laughs> well, there are reasons why sometimes you can't, but but there should be no reason why you <laughs> never make it to a single game. 
I did take a phone call during my kids' soccer game two days ago. I will admit <laughs> that, but I think we're, um, we're all guilty of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was it wasn't perfect, but we did, you know, we we did, and we kept summer Fridays all year round. We just we tried to do as much as we could to ad- adapt the way that we convene and work together. Um, you know, so that it actually matched the new set of requirements in the new environment and didn't, didn't, you know, didn't rub against it. I mean, it was, it's definitely hard and everybody, I mean, again, I just like, I can't believe everybody survived and thrived and, you know, it's just like, it's the, the, the least, the least here at mother, just everybody was just amazing. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I've observed in conversations with people on the brand side is there's a there has been a transition towards this presenteeism of logging in and being visible when, when, when people are remote and answering or sending things out late or really early to make your presence known and show off how hard you're working or how committed you are, or that you're actually, you know, trying to make sure people recognize that you are working because it could be invisible for a lot of people, um, especially orgs that have been fully remote, but at agencies, I, I can probably count on one hands over my 20 something year career, people that I thought were not putting in 50, 60 hours a week anyway. Has that been a concern or people, I mean, from a management perspective, your strategy team, I'm sure the last thing you're worried about is, are they billing their hours? It's almost probably the opposite of like, how do I, how do I protect these people from themselves so they don't feel that they have to do that? Is that something you've dealt with? Yes. Oh, for sure. Um, there's definitely we we had unlimited vacations even before pandemic, um, but I think it's even more important now. Um, and I think again, it's it's um. I think it's a it's about continuing to implement a lot of cultural tricks to then make sure that people feel um, like they can take that, yes. like it's okay to take that, like nobody judges them for that, and that's really soft stuff. But I think it's important stuff. I there's a there's there's a person who works on our team uh, in Los Angeles, and we had a big pitch over the summer, and we sort of managed to do it in a way where the lead creative got to take their vacation, and like one of the junior strategists got to like everybody kind of got to do their thing, but the 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 lead, the lead strategist on it didn't get to. Um, And so I've been talking to her all the time. I'm like, you still like take that vacation now. And a little bit, I was like, I was like, it doesn't even need to be a big vacation now. Like the thing in, in, in our business is just take it when you can get it. Like, even if it's just two days in the middle of the week where you just like go chill or, you know, go get a massage or go do whatever, like do that. And then do, if it's, you know, if it's a Denver ski trip that you need to reschedule, still go do that. But I do think it is about, verbalizing it all the time and creating an environment where people can can adapt to it and we have a whole new set of rules so we definitely have work from home fridays for now um and we also have something and which is just an experiment we're just seeing how it goes but this idea of uh 15 work from anywhere credits um because i think one of the things that we saw that was really cool was people would go and work from mexico city for a week or they would go visit their parents in Denver and spend, you know, take a week off and hang out with their parents and then work from work from home for a week. Right. Um, so we thought that was really cool. And so we're trying to people can then take those credits. And if they want to have like Mondays work from home and Fridays, you work from home, they can use the credits that way. But if they want to go to Mexico City, they can do that as well. So yeah, people well, it's hard. They can do it. I, it's not yeah. ideal when the entire company is doing it. But it but having people move around actually is creates new sources of inspiration. There's benefit. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you are tapping into kind of all the all the tools at your disposal in this new uh, zero gravity version of the sport that you're that we're yeah. all figuring yeah. out. It just it's just we we just have to make a place that continues to be magnetic, you know. And I think the 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 more broader the can creative canvases we have, like media, like production, like design, like you know, experiential, like even venture investing, the more attractive we are, the more interesting this place can be, you know, in terms of having all the different emotional zones. Um, you know, the more inspiring our work, all of you know, it's just like I'm just trying to create as many things that make it attractive to the most creative people so that. Um, people do come in for those parts of work where we need to. I don't need anybody to come in and toil, but I do need people to come in and inspire each other because that's how we get to 
really big fuck you answers to really big questions, not small questions. Like that's part of my, part of my challenge to advertising is it's, it can get really small right now. And it can be about using empathy to optimize your, you know, customer experience stream. And that's cool, but you know, mm-hmm. we should be making C level <laughs> boardroom, you know, uh, conversations about really big topics. And, um, but that's only going to happen if we all get together and if we create a space that just brings everybody together. Awesome. Charlie, um, thank you so much for making time for me today. I really appreciate you dialing in here and joining me. It's been wonderful talking to you. No, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been really super fun. I know people can find you at the mother site. Where else can people find you online specifically? Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. I've, you know, I've got an Instagram, but it's probably not for everybody. Um, <laughs> and I, whatever, I, I try not to be too much of a blowhard that I probably should, you know, write more articles, but uh, yeah, find me at mother for sure. Find me on LinkedIn and I'm easy to find and I'm happy to talk and do, uh, to anything people want me to do. Awesome. Thank you, Charlie. It's been great, great talking to you. Thank you, Adam. Strategy Inside Everything is produced by me, Adam Kierno. If you liked what you heard, please leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. It really helps. If someone shared this with you and you're just not sure where you could find it, you can go to specific.substack.com and sign up there and get episodes before everybody else. For more information about me, Adam Kierno, you can go to adamkierno.com. There's information about my books, my speaking, and my strategy work. Have an idea for a guest? Send it my way. Just go to adampierno.com and you'll find a form there that'll help you connect. Thanks for listening.